All right, well, that's probably a good amount of time. Uh, all right, well, people may join us. People then. will be coming in, but uh, welcome all. Um, Calling all Floss founders. So this is um, vaguely related to some, some areas I've been thinking about a lot, about uh, people who are starting these free software projects. Um, what can we tell about the projects? Uh, looking at some of the literature, there has been a number of um, studies on development activity and on different things. And there have been a few surveys about uh, what people do and why they start it and that type of thing. I'm really kind of interested in what effects some of those initial decisions have on later decisions, or I mean, on later things that happen in the life cycle of a piece of software. So one of like kind of this, this way I'm um, defining founder decisions is it's, it's the choices that are made before any other community gets involved. So it could be by one or a few people. And specifically, it's choices that are kind of challenging to change later. So b the big examples that I have, and I'm hoping to you know, have a discussion here about what more there might be, and um, then how those interacted with, with everyone here's uh, projects. But, the big one um, that you can think of on like the technical um, scale is programming language. You had to decide what language it was in, and that's not usually by committee, right? That's not, your community doesn't necessarily make that choice consciously. They join your project, and that's the language the project's in. And then the other big one is software license. So you had to decide if it was GPL, AGPL, BSD, like those, those decisions were made and as soon as you have commit number two, it gets quite a bit harder to ever change that decision because now you have to talk to all of your other developers. And we see it, it's not impossible. That's like it's not impossible to fully rewrite something that was in one language into another one. It does happen. But usually, those are the types of decisions that I'm looking at. Um, <clears throat> so before we get started, uh, if we could just do like a 30, 60 second, um, Introduction. Uh, just think about you know. <coughs> well, uh, I'd like to hear uh, you know, your experience with free software, and then uh, maybe how much time you spend maintaining it, creating it, um, and yeah, just a quick kind of intro about where where people are sitting, specifically looking kind of at the founding of free software. Um, I guess I can kind of start. So. <laughs> William Salt Hale, uh, Salt, and I've been working with Free Software for 25 years, give or take, on or off, um, mostly around Linux. As far as founding <coughs> software, I have yeah, always, I've done little things, right? But I don't know if I founded a software community, I would say. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, sure. I, I guess that makes me in, right? Um, I'm, I'm David Champion. Um, I, I guess I've been doing open source. I don't have any communities. Um, but yeah, I, what were the things? Um, yeah, just kind of your experience um, with free software, like length of time. Yeah. You, you haven't founded any communities, right. but you've written projects. Yeah. I mean, okay. All right. I've been writing software for 25 to 30 years. It's all open source, but I don't publish any of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's that's that. I mean, that's not. Uh, I think uncommon. I don't, I don't think that's uncommon yeah. at all. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, my name is Aaron Wolf. I have been involved in any of this for <coughs> roughly six years, uh, maybe seven, but really six years, and. I am co-founder, uh, initially reluctantly, of the project snowdrift.coop, which is a software project and also a web platform and a community and innovating in other ways that are social and economic and things, so it's kind of craziness uh, in that sense. And I uh, 
have, have been learning all along the way about all of the different issues and what other people face and was sort of hesitant, but I didn't get into it to, to start something because I was already involved in it. I was hesitant about the entire founding process or whatever else and had to be convinced that uh, what we were doing was both needed and nobody else was already doing it. Um, on the end, I'm fairly new to the open source community. Um, I'm here because we're actually looking to build a community around our local college um, with open source hackathons and things like that. Uh, Tim will probably talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Timothy Crosley. I have been in the open source community probably for around 15 years, my best estimate. Um, and I run a bunch of uh, fairly successful Python projects and have built communities around those to varying degrees of success. Um, and then we're also trying to uh, start the open source hackathon. We've done two now, I have a third one on Monday. Um, if anybody's in Seattle, it's in Lipton Springs. Um, and we also, one of the things that we're trying to do is build more open source and real life communities like that. Um, so we've also been doing other community work like we helped convince our neighborhood with this blog and an open source GitHub repository and people do Request to make new articles. Um, it's pretty incredible to break down the barrier of folks being able to make edits to the online website. Right. Yeah. Touching a little bit on what you said earlier, when I started out, open source work it was all um, because I don't have a degree, um, and while I was too young to do a degree whenever I started, it was all to build sort of a portfolio of work, um, and that sort of shifted now that I want to make maintainable projects because. I started seeing projects I built. People would still use them, but they weren't being maintained because I had other things to do. All right, thank you. My name is Eric. Um, <coughs> I'm the open source community. I'm Eric, the IT guy. Um, <coughs> I've been in open source and the community for about four years. I've been in IT for coming up on 11. Um, I'm not quite. I didn't quite meet the uh, the, the description set forward, but uh, in the uh, in the talk description, but. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can help standardize or build a community around uh, operations or open source projects. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of, uh, I do uh, some work with Jupiter Broadcasting, the Noah Show, and one of the things I hear from, from different, uh, different project leaders is um, it's hard to get builds. It's hard to, um, GitHub's great for storing my code, but it's everything else. I'm, I'm running builds on my laptop and it takes 12 hours when it should take 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm here for a few different reasons. I'm, I'm a solutions architect at GitLab, and so uh, GitLab offers free licensing for open source projects uh, for GitLab.com, which is a SaaS offering, um, and that would give issue boards and code repositories and build pipelines and Kubernetes integrations. Uh, so I'm, I'm here not directly representing GitLab, but I'm, Basically, just told them, hey, send me, send me this conference that I want to go to. And <laughs> bring some information. Back. But uh, I'm, I'm here wearing a couple of hats. One is, is uh, trying to see how GitLab can become better involved in the community. Um, second, as uh, as someone who's doing more and more content creation, more and more uh, open source journalism. Uh, so just kind of thinking about reporting on on, this, on the state of, of open source. And third is as someone who, who isn't a developer, um, but has an operations background, is infrastructure minded, um, how can we leverage tools like the cloud? How can we uh, how can we pool resources between projects to maybe do colos or something like that? Um, I, I don't, it's, it's a very ambiguous idea in my head, but just trying to figure out how we can, how we can pull all the community's resources together and have shared, shared compute power um, as opposed to someone who runs a, an entire distro trying to do their builds on a laptop. So just kind of trying to get a feel for how, how we can, as a, a this community, can work together and share resources. I think I can help you when we, when we get to yeah. of those projects over because the original maintainer didn't uh, 
care for them anymore that now I feel myself like, oh, this is like quite overwhelming to to be dealing with all of these issues that had been filed over the years before. Uh, some bug requests, others sending pull requests for features that I'm like, this is definitely out of scope. Um, and yeah, then dealing with these discussions if this, like, should this be an add on, or if, like, I really don't see this in the scope. Um, uh, but on the other side, also encouraging new PRs to come in for for bug fixes or for a new functionality that has been decided on this is in the scope. Hi, uh, Michael Downey. Um, I got involved with open source, I guess. I guess I started with Linux around 19, 20 years ago. Think about, it. Um, about 15 years ago, I worked to set up an open source usability lab, uh, part of a grad school program. And these days, uh, I work for the United Nations Foundation and run our open source program there. And uh, similarly, you know, what you're talking about, uh, we try to figure out how to identify resources, money, stuff, people, uh, that open source projects need that are uh, serving the developing world or, or emergency situations in different ways. Uh, and then how to pool resources together uh, and, and find them because there's lots of stuff out there but it's spread very thin. Um, how to make those connections. So that's kind of our, our day job now. Um, hi there, I'm Emily. I haven't been at this super long. Like somebody handed me a Linux CD when I was in high school and I sort of Get a little out of control from there. Um, <laughs> I do ops at Mozilla for my job, and um, I, I maintain a few things, some that I sort of lucked into by being the last active user of them, and um, I've had the occasional project that's accidentally gotten users that wasn't supposed to, like my resume that's written in LaTeX, like a lot of people use it as a template, and it's weird. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to show up and work, and that didn't turn out to be an option, so <laughs> hi. <laughs> Uh, I'm Andy. I'm maybe the mole of the group. Uh, in a, in a Wait, does that mean you write <coughs> proprietary software? <laughs> no, no, but I, I think, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a good anti founder. In the battle of perfect versus good, I fight proudly on the side of perfect. I say no a lot. Um, but I'm here. <laughs> Uh, I'm Lance Hopperson, and I'm the director of the Open Source Lab at Lincoln State University. Um, I've been using Linux and open source for about 20 years. I've been involved with projects for about 15 years. I initially was part of the infrastructure team for Gentoo many moons ago. Uh, but um, these days, running the lab, we primarily provide infrastructure resources for a lot of open source projects. Um, whether that's co-location, we have our own private cloud, we have OpenStack, have our public mirrors. Um, we do all the things, and we also employ undergrad students, like Emily was one of our students at one point. <laughs> and um, we uh, get, a, get a lot of undergraduate students' experience managing systems, and they get out in the world and do awesome things, like uh, become co founders of CoreOS and all that fun stuff. You guys did good work. Huh? You guys did good work. Thank you. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> Very excited. <laughs> did we miss you? Oh, I'm just taking notes. Um, I haven't founded anything, um, but I first installed Linux uh, in 1994. It was Slackware, and it was Fluffy is that I stole from the computer lab. Um, so I know a few things about uh, Linux and open source, um, but I'm just taking notes today to support Salt's project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. So we have a pretty wide uh, background. Here. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to build on the we were talking about licensing those you wanna uh, decisions well, at the beginning. Um, you want to talk about that? So, so I, w I would before going into any one decision, I'd like to hear what people think uh, beyond the two I have laid out as founder decisions. Did any other ones come to mind? Maybe while you've been thinking here, um, one that I'm, I've been a little on the edge with is component naming. Because that is something that is one of those types of decisions, but it also happens later when there's a community, and it isn't that hard to change, but it kind of is, right? It becomes part of the culture, um, so yeah. I would, I would say that how and where you choose to publish your code has a pretty substantial impact on 
who gets involved, much as language choice does, because when it's just when it's a very new project, someone is unlikely to learn a whole new tool chain just for your thing. Yeah, I think there's a cloud culture is a big factor. Um, there's tons of examples I can bring up, but like somebody suggesting we can have a meeting on Google Hangouts, and then somebody saying, "Well, I'm not going to be there," and you know, the reason a that there was somebody to object was because of a proactive decision to reach out to the people who would be the most passionate and would be the people like Andrew who would care about all of the principles and the foundations and whatever. And then going along with that and just making the decision that making certain compromises means that you're going to exclude voices who are not going to go along with you. So if you go in certain directions, uh, there's like communities of people or cultures or whatever else who then decide not to participate and then those voices are absent in your project. This is huge. Um, so I, I've been involved with a project for many years called MUT. Um, it's an email application and it has suffered from exactly that problem. Um, we maintained it for a very long time in CVS and that as distributed version control became big that you know, the choice to remain in CVS because the people leaving the project at that time didn't see the value of distribution alienated a lot of people who were getting on board with DVCS. And there were like <laughs> four different DVCS tools at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we finally made the decision to go to Mercurial. And Mercurial is awesome. I cannot love it enough. It's fabulous. And I don't like it. And the uh, other people <laughs> leaving the project with me felt the same way. So we remained on Mercurial for many years even as Git's Remain. popularity uh, skyrocketed and Mercurial's kind of just went like this. Um, and, and that kept us out of communities a lot. Uh, it, was, it was a lot harder to attract developers because of that choice. Whether it was the right choice or the wrong choice, you know, the purist would say stick with your guns. But, you know, if you want contributors, you have to choose the tooling that those people are using. I see the same. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if, like, uh, because we, I am kind of experiencing the same, but more with platforms like this GitLab versus GitHub versus GitT, and what instances <laughs> is hosted on. Um, but in the end, it's all the same code. So I, I wonder if there's some kind of like, if we can make it more of a separation of, yeah, this is a more central place where we host and discuss issues and pull requests, whereas um, it might be a, like have multiple replicas of the same code base with like, oh, this is like the master branch and uh, every there's, yeah, there's no code that versioning that system can can deal with, there is, with but this. <laughs> yeah, that would be an option. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of thing I think is a great idea but it's really hard to implement and there's not a lot of passion around it. Yeah, you end up being the founder of the yeah. Mercurial Git project <laughs> instead of what thing you were founding. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would want to come back to this idea of like federating distributed version control. Mm -hmm. um, just to throw some other ideas out mm -hmm. for you. Um, in our work, we have a kind of a, like a life cycle based uh, kind of checklist of things to think about. Um, so I just thought I'd throw some of these up. So we, I think we've covered like communication platforms generally. Um, we talked a little bit about IP, um, but I would add in like also there's a larger question of, uh, and you kind of touched on it uh, as well, as, like how how community engaged do you want to be? <laughs> um, and, and that can drive things as well. Like do you want to do a CLA or, or a, a copyright assignment or BCO or nothing? Or, you know, there's some strategies there. Um, we like to encourage people to think about um, if you want to, if anyone's planning to make money off of this thing to start with. If you're going to try to do it as a as the maintainer and you want to, you want that to be your job. There's some decisions you can make uh, to kind of structure things. Or if you want a lot of people to try to make money off this thing, um, you may want to make a few different decisions. Um, and then that kind of also t turns into like, do you need like a fiscal sponsor, right, to, to set things up, or or if money does start coming in, how's that going to be managed? Um, and then finally, like the idea, this is a little bit related, but how do you decide what this 
thing you're building is going to be what's the vision for it, right? And do you want to keep that all to yourself? Do you want a more democratic process? Um, but just even making, taking a little time to think about that at the beginning, um, maybe writing it down if you're, if you're smart about it, um, so other people will know and they don't get their own idea because a lot of people will come into some projects and like just expect that they ought to be able to get their, uh, you know, their merge request uh, approved and, and some find that strange when it doesn't. <laughs> Um, but just kind of make things clear up front uh, tends to get people on board quicker if that's what you want to happen. Building off of your vision comment about investment of time, of investing time into documentation, into you know, what your vision is to help ease onboard new folks is something that mm -hmm. I, I think a lot about mm -hmm. versus you know, creating, right? Yeah, I've, <coughs> I've been thinking a lot recently about the best ways to do that sort of shared vision approach. Like bigger projects, it's hard. A lot of projects start small. They start with one or two people, and they, they grow. Um, but whenever you have a lot of people, it's really nice to have an RFC type approach or something like F8, or, or not F8, but Fs for Python. Um, and I'm not sure about the best way to sort of bootstrap that process. I haven't seen a lot of smaller GitHub repos or GitLab repos have it. Um, you might take a look at the Chef community. Um, of course, they just deprecated the repository. <laughs> License <laughs> change. But they had a process where they had a, a repository where they had all of their RFCs there and they would discuss everything there and they would have the weekly meetings or kind of in the process of changing that. But that was a pretty good method, I thought, for getting community involvement in things. To call back to what Aaron was saying about how tech choices are going to exclude somebody, um, in a broader sense as well. Um, since society has groups of people with mutually exclusive beliefs, you need to decide at some point what you're going to do about that. And not deciding is itself a decision. So by setting forth some sort of community guidelines or ideals, you can avoid the situation where <coughs> you just you get the status quo of whoever shows up first. Because the status quo of whoever shows up first to a brand new tech project because they like new tech things is often, by definition, not going to include the kind of people who don't necessarily have as much time to put into tech projects, let's say, uh, and might be <coughs> represented for a bunch of systemic reasons. And so I feel like the Rust project did a really good job of being conscious of those community decisions and how, when you have mutually exclusive groups, you either have to pick which one you'd rather have, pick a way of keeping that out of your project, or just deal with whoever gets there first. Because mm -hmm. removing them later is, um, ask Benno Rice sometime about FreeBSD's attempt to um, start having a code of conduct if you would like some stories and sadness of what happens when you just let whoever gets there first get there first and try and fix it later. Uh, so, code conduct, speaking of that, was also another one that's come up a little bit. Things like that. Um, we've talked about some of this starting documentation, starting expectations, right? About what your project will be, the type of expectation. I mean, some of that could be seen through the license, maybe, but um, code conduct or yeah, documentation a, templates. Another topic. Um, is about understanding your context, like how it fits into whatever else exists. So um, briefly, sort of my experience was not starting off to be a startup of something and deciding that I wanted to understand what the scope of everything was and that if I was going to start something, I felt like almost to prove it to myself, because I would be the sort of critic who would say this, that uh, I had to do the due diligence and figure out everything else that existed to make sure that I wasn't being the jerk who like wasted all my energy on some new thing when somebody else could have super used my help to end up creating the thing that we, I was trying to do anyway. And uh, then I've also had the experience since then of validating that idea because despite having done all the due diligence and publishing it to show everybody about all the things that exist in the space that we're in, I keep running into people who say, Oh, but I already started. I you know registered the domain on Friday, and so I'm going to keep going with my thing instead of helping with things that ex already exist. And uh, yeah, there's this significance I think uh, because there are other people out there 
about validating sort of why you're founding something. So it's kind of a, a matter of the due diligence of knowing how you fit into things and what else is, is happening already. I relate so hard to that. <laughs> I mean, I've written, I've written hundreds of programs, um, at least. And where are they? I don't know. They're, they're on my hard drive somewhere. Because finding out whether those things already exist, whether they're, and you know, of course, for a long time they weren't because open source wasn't that big. But finding out whether those things that I was looking for already exist somewhere and whether I should be throwing it with somebody who I then have to politic with in order to get the goals, to meet the goals that I'm looking for, um, that's a lot of work. I, I don't know uh, parallels of this in other communities. I'm guessing there are them. Um, in the Python community, the Python subreddit is amazing for solving that problem. <laughs> you just post a comment and they're like, oh yeah, there's these projects you should should contribute to, or my experience, I posted for this project, and they're like, hey, I want to contribute back to this project. <laughs> Either way, I learned. <laughs> and, I mean, come back to me. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of different ideas, a lot of different issues. I'm, I'm looking for kind of a solid flow. You know, can we get to, can we get to an action item at the end of this conversation where we can all go back to our, our projects and, and say, Let's try this. I know it'll be hard. Maybe it's consolidation of communication tools. Maybe it's looking at how, how can we federate uh, tools like GitLab, GitHub, all these others. Uh, and I'm, I'm just looking for a common thread at the moment. So like telling what your project needs um, is less likely to come from a room full of other projects than to come from talking to your own users and asking them what it feels like to work with your project and looking for the, the underlying threads of, oh, I had to work around this, but my work around is great, blah, blah, blah. It's like, ah, there's some that. But when you say about trying to get the documentation perfect before you before you release and so forth, and you say, you don't found things because <laughs> perfect is the enemy of good. Like, for better or worse, the ecosystem ends up with the projects where someone just ran with it. And if you want to deliberate for a decade on how to do it, then you'll still be deliberating, and there will come to be a thing in the space that didn't deliberate. So, <laughs> right. past a certain point, you kind of got to just trust that it'll be good enough and that you can fix it later. So, so the, the culture of founding <coughs> is related to that. So my point is broadly is kind of like I want to advocate outside of my project that I'm not saying it's a perfect thing, but there's some amount of due diligence that all the questions we're talking about today are like the idea that you're taking responsibility that founding has all these ramifications and you do the due diligence to think them through at the very least that means something like trying to figure out if it's easy enough to find resources or whatever so you could look at a list of licenses you could look at like different programming languages and somebody could say uh, you're going to start something like just know that there's a thing where you should feel some pressure to do your due diligence at the beginning. One thing I'm, I'm hearing over and over is, is this idea that reminds me of a conversation I had with someone at Microsoft uh, recently about GitHub. Um, and GitHub, I don't know who, if anyone else remembers this, like way back in the day, like one of their, their taglines or something was about like social coding, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where like when it was new, when it was new, new, it was like we didn't know exactly what it would evolve into. Um, this idea where like you could actually easily understand all of the work that was going on, right? And who else was doing things similar to me or thinking about things similar to me? Uh, because as a group of people that care more or less about collaborative work on technology, uh, we do an awful bad job at like, really communicating broadly or globally. We have all of these fractured places where we have conversations and, and doc document in one form or another kind of the, what we're thinking about and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and there's very, Poor visibility across all these fragmented systems, and uh, that's why we and you meant. Well, maybe I mentioned it first, like the federation idea of how can we connect all of these somehow more? These conversations happening because um, I don't think it's probably reasonable to say like there's one centralized place where everyone has to go. But we don't know what's going on. Well, we don't know what we don't know. It's a big problem. I disagree quite strongly with the intuition that federation would fix it because the way I feel about knowing what else is going on in the space is that there are too many data points about what other people are doing. And I don't need to double or triple or quadruple the number of data points flowing at me. I need synthesis of it. Mm -hmm. And where are, are there other areas of thought 
where people manage to do that synthesis somehow, whether it's centralized or not, or has this problem been solved in any other discipline of human endeavor? <laughs> I think I, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I just I was going to say my, my first inclination is so aligned. This is kind of meta, but uh, when I came into the tech community, my main thought was, like, why does agile exist? Why does et cetera, et cetera? Because these, the, everything that everybody's talking about is not tech specific. It makes zero sense to me that tech is creating their own solutions to anything that isn't tech because all of it exists in like a 100 times larger world out there. Why don't we just use, like build on the ideas that exist? I have speculation on that, but I, I think it's not as good as the rest of the conversation yeah. could be, so we should chat. So like, like to your point, one of the problems that, that we keep talking about is coming back to naming conventions or licensing schemes. All that information about what the different licenses are exists out there. But there's some over here, and then there's some over here, and then there's this half-finished website that someone set out to collect all that information and bring right. it together, like you're talking about. We have 11 standards. Mm -hmm. We should. That's, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm. In thinking. the time it took us to say that, another standard emerged. Right. Exactly. And that's the problem. Is you're you're talking about. You're you're never going to get the tech community to consolidate to a single set of tools. GitHub used to be the de facto standard for for a distributed version of control. Probably the biggest change to that that I can see is when Microsoft bought them, because there are so many developers out there that have such a bad taste in their mouths the from, from what Microsoft did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be clear, I'm wearing my open source contributor hat right now. Get my hat because I was hired after that happened. And well, actually, Microsoft buying GitHub is probably why GitLab had the money to. Hire That's why they had the money. Yeah, exactly. But. Uh, Wearing my open source contributor hat, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of, I know a bunch of projects that the, the day that was announced moved off mm -hmm. of GitHub because now Microsoft owns it and Microsoft has this, this reputation it's, that yeah. it's going to take a couple of generations, if ever, for them to lose that stigma mm -hmm. of the 1990s version of Microsoft. The day so, that was announced, the GitLab page <laughs> had load problems. Yes, yeah. it did. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I kind of want to see if we can think about here is the people you consider around you um, when you're founding projects. Did, did, did you, do you, is it usually a solo endeavor? I mean, that's at least the, the myth we tell ourselves, right? So I wouldn't have done what I did But at all. I know you, you, you're mentioning co-founder for sure, so. Um, but but what, what do other people, I mean, in my experience, a lot of things are little scripts or little projects for myself, right? It's not even with the intention of being a founder, but I'm sure that's not always the case. I think for me, it's like a 50-50. Either was, especially originally, it was all stuff I created myself because, you know, it wasn't a job or anything. But then once I started working in the workforce, I would try to find opportunities with team members to say, oh, this isn't something that's about our core business. Let's see if we can open source it. Mm -hmm. um, they still would put the work to open source it on me. Uh, but <laughs> it was still a community or a multiple people endeavor. I, yeah, I think it, it, it usually is a, a, a single endeavor initially for some things. It's def a, a, usually it's scratching a specific edge, but it kind of depends on the situation. If it's a group of individuals working together on something, and they can really work together and say, let me do it that one way, or it's one person, like I wrote this tool, I don't know if anybody wants it, but I open sourced it, and now it becomes a big thing. You know? um, so yeah, that's We've seen that even when the, there's like a, an organization or a company to begin with, they still face a lot of the same problems that an individual might have, right? Because the company kind of acts as a unit, right? Because you're doing it because it's your job or whatever. Um, and they haven't really thought about how to deal with others uh, with, that, with different ideas about how things ought to be, right? Um, so they're not quite the same, but um, and it's important to remember, but they're still pretty similar. Um, yeah, I, I think the wide majority start out that way, right? Because, I mean, all ideas, you know, maybe a lot of people have the same idea, but somebody actually kicks it and yeah. kicks it off and finds other people who are like-minded in each other. Yeah. But we're not. I would contrast starting a, an open source project um, against doing a group project in school. And the, the main difference, I think, is that when you're doing a project that meets some need of your own, you kind of need to be working with people of an extremely similar background, extremely similar problem, because 
there is really complex ideas you need to be able to articulate to each other. And you can articulate those ideas faster if you think more alike. And they take a super long time to articulate with someone who's just radically different from you and has a totally different approach. Whereas on a school project, you just, you're four random people from random backgrounds, and you can hardly get anything done because you spend most of your time defining your terms. And so I think that also happens to be near the root of the like diversity problems that a lot of communities complain about because you kind of can't efficiently work together to get the core thing that proves your idea is worthwhile if with people who think too differently at the very start. Right. Yeah, I have a really specific experience with that because basically I am here because somebody who is much more experienced than I, long experience, you know, sort of convinced me like, you can do it, we can do this together, etc. <laughs> just a person who had this sort of attitude of, we can go through all of the work that it takes to bring anybody up to speed. And we can, you know, and I, I really appreciate this sort of, we had came, we started from the very beginning with the foundation of a culture that sort of everybody can participate. There's something you can do and there's ways we can, we will help you along, etc. And I still am not sure what to think about this, but as it worked out, I can chalk up like extreme amounts of investment that went into maintaining that in the sense that uh, people, it's instead of, just like jumping to just, okay, you're not quite ready to do what we need. We need this person who's like an expert. Uh, we really encourage this like community and building of as many people as possible in a diverse community. And although I still support that and I value all that, I, it, it's definitely extremely costly. And there's like all these people of uh, somebody who spent a year or something uh, eating up time from everybody else, getting help even, you know, and. In some cases, it's like that, that's the person who turned into the most dedicated, you know. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, whatever. Maybe it was one out of ten that kept going, and the other were like, we ended up spending a lot of time helping them or whatever else. So that was just like an experience that they got, and, and we got nothing out of it, but it was a lot of cost. I feel like you got lucky that nobody else um, snuck up behind you and moved a lot faster. Uh, no, that's happened. Like, I mean, in our space specifically, uh, we started before <laughs> Patreon existed. And, right. Uh, yep. okay. we, if we so, had first mover advantage yep. and we had all the yep. right tools, yep. uh, we would have been like our vision for open source and everything needs to be public goods would have launched before Patreon existed. I mean, that's dramatic. Like that's first mover problem. advantage, like the, the world would be a different world today if we had just had all the we gathered together the team of the world's greatest experts who cared about what we were doing and we all did it instead of saying like. Well, I got into this because I don't know the whatever, and then I'm being brought up to speed. We care about the engaging the community, and, and we're all volunteers. We didn't do the VC thing, whatever. And it's a huge means versus ends question. For inclusion. sure, sure. There's parts of that. So look at all the issues that uh, surround Patreon, right? Oh, I mean, they are. Just the short of it is, they are VC funded, so they're on that path, and no matter what, they're screwed. That's their path. Like they can't stop at we are functional because they have to keep giving an exponential return. And that path is, it, it, that's the path for everyone ever if you go down that path. So that's a, that's a, talking about founding decisions. If you go and do your fundraising and you get like investors, that's, you know, every single investor based, you know, you're gonna get a return. Floss Project is a totally different beast. It's on a totally different trajectory than, than the others. Even, even if it's free software. Sorry to sidetrack, but so we have GitHub being a big player and GitLab being the little guy. We have Patreon being a big player and Snowdrift being the little guy. GitHub goes boom and suddenly everyone's on GitLab. Patreon goes boom in its own way. What's different that we don't suddenly have everyone on Snowdrift um, in the same way? Well, the fact is that GitLab is uh, VC funded as well, and so they have all the funding and they are on that same trajectory and they're just burnt further down the line, so that's why they exist and they have all, that they can hire him, and et cetera. So uh, th that's, the, that's the fact of it. But we do get, every single time Patreon screws up and like pisses people off, we get a bunch of people on the internet sharing the, Snowdrift doesn't exist yet, but they put together this page of the 70 other things that are alternatives to Patreon explaining it all, and so this is the best resource in the, you know, out there. Here, everybody, you should look at this wiki page. So that ties <laughs> into something I was thinking about, and <laughs> the, this idea, the, the source was ridiculous. I think it's highly involved with uh, Elon. It's a, it's a space based MMO. Right? Uh, it's society simulator. That's not the way to Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I feel better about myself now. Uh, 
<laughs> but with, within EVE Online, their, their tutorials and their video content were somewhat lacking, or were out of date, or the, the vocal quality was, was poor, so you couldn't really get much out of it. Uh, so up came a, they, they have corporations for, to be their guilds or their, their, their social groups. An organization popped up called EVE University. You could join as a, as a new player, and you could join other new players, and there were experienced players who would conduct raids, who would do mining operations and this kind of thing, um, and would take new players under their wing. And there was mentor programs, and there was, there was recorded classes, there was live classes where you'd log into the game, and, and you jump on mics, and, and you could learn about the game. And Eve University ended up putting better content together, a better community together, than the parent organization. So I'm wondering if if that's something more that the open source community needs, and I, I preface this with maybe an organization like this exists, and we just need to put more more of the community's power behind that organization. But if there was a group out there that had connections throughout the community, who could who could be supported by Snowdrift, who could have hardware, who who could have oh, access to hardware, who could have basically an open source job board of um, someone who, who goes out there and curates his job board of, we can... <laughs> That's basically what I do. Yeah, <laughs> it's a right yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just need to talk. Yeah. So, but, Aaron, real quick. Yeah. I don't think that saying the difference is they have money is necessarily a complete answer. No, Because it, it, what, what work is getting done with that money that isn't getting done through volunteers and why do you have volunteers that will do work A but not work B? I think, you know, you have to, in my experience, like the, the most important thing you start out with that everything else follows from is release early, release often. Yes. You have to be releasing to be competitive. Um, the projects that I have that are successful, I do an immense amount of work to onboard people, more than I probably should, but they're still successful only because I release often and I release early. The question of what successful means is a whole other fascinating thing. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's for people. I think. I mean, I think money. I mean, Snowdrift, ironically, is about funding. And the point is, if I believed that the challenges we're talking about weren't really fundamentally tied to capital at the end of the day, like having money and resources and the privileges that come with that, um, and you know, the volunteers being the people who work at a company that they're paid a lot more than they need to just get by even and they're, they're privileged enough to not worry about spending some extra time on whatever else or have this extra free time. Um, it, the core economics of it, if it wasn't, in my view, primarily living at that level as the main differentiating thing, I wouldn't have found it Snowdrift. Because the entire point is that we think most of the Floss projects that have potential that aren't reaching it is because of that reason. And that's what we are aiming to address at the core level of it. And GitLab was a compromise because GitLab I is on this track, does have this enterprise sort of thing, and just like every, there are people who are shocked, although I was not at all shocked about the buyout of you know, GitHub, uh, I don't know what the out is for GitLab. You know, I know they're hoping to do an IPO or something so that they don't just get bought out, but um, you know, what is their, their exit? They're on this path, and all the alternatives, like Calithia or whatever, you know, which is a software freedom conservancy, you know, Mercurial project, project, whatever, yes. <laughs> Mercurial, something, right? Um, you know, they are in the same boat. So every other place that I mean, you can talk, correlation is absolutely clear to me. Uh, you want to look at what, how did they succeed, et cetera? It's always like, well, they had money. So it really, I, I must have asked my question for like, okay. because <laughs> I definitely see where you're coming from, but what I'm wondering is, what work are they spending the money on that is going undone in your community? Um, I mean, in our case, it's literally like we need to get lawyers. I don't have. I had a pro bono lawyer who turned out to not know enough about about floss. So he was like, "Okay, this is I'm going to open my head." And now we don't have another pro bono lawyer. And I know some lawyers who will help us if we can pay them. And uh, you know, that's like one of the elements that we have. Uh, and then there's literally we had a developer full time because a. VC funded company who I think does basically bad things in the world was paying my co-founder uh, more than he needed to live and he was able to say, I don't have time anymore, but here's enough money to underpay a full-time developer to do what I was hoping to do. 
And that took us a huge way forward because he was just able to not have a day job. And then at some point he was like, I can't keep doing this underpaid thing. And you know, my co-founder was like, I'm not gonna keep working for the evil company. And that's not happening anymore. And like, literally it's the snow dilemma that we're just trying to solve, but we need to solve it for ourselves first or something. Well, there is like a third sort of strategy, which is I think a lot of these successful open source projects that exist, money has, to, people have to get paid, people have to live, right? Yeah. But the other philosophy that a project starting to make money is these companies that are profitable, they start projects just as a way to work on something together. So they're not competing on the level where. Um, oh yeah, there, there's lots of inefficiencies <coughs> and things. There's, there's lots of things that we do even to make it work, given that we have no, no capital that we're still moving forward, and that's there's tons of challenges in that. It's not impossible, but. So we are um, at time. So I want to thank everyone for coming here, sharing. I really appreciate it. I love to follow up with you, everyone more about this. Um, I hope to eventually turn this into an actual project and things. But uh, thanks for at least <laughs> adding some insight into uh, what I think will hopefully grow into something else. I incidentally, for. <coughs> reference, there are some resources that have been made. So, uh, one that I think of most is Carl Fogel's um, dark, what is it, open source, what's the name of the book? Open source. Producing open source. Producing open source. Open source. Yeah. yeah. Um, and V2, not the, the old one that's still white. Yeah, version two. Use version two. <laughs> uh, he, he updated it. Um, version two has a cool little footnote about how, like, Snowdrift.com is one option for fundraising, maybe if they're launched by the time you're reading this. And, um, and anyway, they have this wiki page where they did all the research. Um, Harvard, like, claim fame, but it's, it's honestly, it's just amazing, and it's a, like a full-length book, so, you know, it took him a huge amount of time to put together, here's the list of all the things, if you were gonna do the, like, total due diligence my version, you would, like, read his book and do every single step to, like, get it all done, right? There's other resources like that out there, too. All right. And we could all be contributing to them. They are projects <laughs> in themselves. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>